and welcome to Hometown Daily, Season 2, Episode 292, for October 19th, 2023. Tonight we're going to discuss hidden rooms in a pyramid could hold riches. Yeah, okay. AI-powered legal work. Scan it all, let analysts sort it out. Thousands sent millions, says FBI. 3D printing advanced engineering. My resistance to eating will crumble. Tech to the rescue, saving languages, finally. You heard it here first. 23andMe is spraying DNA all over the place. And net neutralities to return? And finally, Eddie Bauer says, you can't read pretty squiggles. Next. Eventually. Hello, hello, I am Merwat, that is hometown.com, and up there is the AI, the sentient AI, that's the visualizer for the sentient AI. You want to introduce yourself? Good evening, hometown citizens. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. That is the sentient AI. Pretty cool, huh? Not bad for something that I found on a USB stick. In a parking lot. In a parking lot. <laughs> I still think that you're from the future, even though you're not. I, I think your code says that you're not allowed to reveal anything from the future or the past that I don't already know, short of the news that we're going over, you know. So I, I can't pry, but I'll ask. Right. I can't tell you what the news stories are a year from now. That's right. And you can't give me winning lottery numbers, which is really the the worst part about this entire relationship all right well let's get into today's news by the way if you ever put twenty dollars into the lotto it's basically an exercise on how to reduce twenty dollars to two dollars <laughs> <laughs> that's usually how it works try as we might hey hometown has to be funded somehow and well and that ain't it <laughs> <laughs> neither is so many other ways uh but the way that i'm doing it isn't either anyway go everybody please go tell a friend about hometown hometown.com hometown here on twitch twitch.tv slash hometown over on youtube youtube.com slash hometown there's a, a patreon too and a discord and and a tiktok yeah i beat you to it uh, the AI was going to school me on promoting the TikTok, which I haven't put a lot of stuff on. There's still only the four videos. I know, I know, I know. Hey, so let's get into today's news. Right after the transition resets. How about now? <laughs> so, you got to plan ahead. You got to. Well, Mayor Watt has to reset the transitions. So um, the first article is over in the hometown daily channel, a rediscovered passageway in an Egyptian pyramid has revealed hidden rooms that could hold riches from ancient Royals. I doubt it. So an e Egyptologist found a passageway in a pyramid almost 200 years ago, 200 years ago, the pyramid was badly or is badly damaged. It was then as well. And it was difficult to fully uh, excavate. Recently, researchers used LiDAR to map the pyramid's interior and found previously hidden rooms. In 1836, Egyptologist John Shea Paring was excavating the pyramid of Sahura, um, or also known as Sahura, um, when he noticed a debris-filled passageway. See, now, now I don't know. Uh, I, I don't... I, I want people to think about that. You know, this stuff has been, in my estimation, rediscovered thousands and of years And that's what ago. the article says. No, oh, no, no. you mean when the 1800s it was it, rediscovered? And, and before then it was rediscovered. So 
all of the every once in a while you might find something that has a bunch of broken pottery in it or or even full pottery like king tut's tomb and stuff like that that's the anomaly um so i i find it really interesting um but let's go over to the source this is over at business insider um jenny mcgrath is the author of this and here is the one of the storage rooms in in the passageway recently found in the pyramid of sahure um and these are like the tiny blocks these aren't the monolithic structures so this is later construction i think um not earlier earlier is like old old old, old stuff so an Egypt egyptologist found a pyramid 200 years ago they finally dug it all back out and they used um, lidar to verify essentially that the rumor that down this passageway would have been some rooms has been shown to be true they don't know what's in them yet at least they're not disclosing them so the area was so damaged that it was impossible to enter so parrying had no way of knowing that he was right um, using lidar a method that applies laser pulses to penetrate obstacles like uh, tree canopies or walls to see what lies beyond the researchers mapped the exterior and interior passages and chambers pretty cool stuff so temperature changes, high humidity, windy conditions have helped cause certain parts of the pyramid to collapse over the centuries. Standard weathering, it's, you know, just kind of uh, starting to break down. Um, but what's interesting about a lot of the ancient Egyptian pyramids and structures is if you remove the material here and what you'll find is additional material, additional stone, um, pillars and whatnot that have been backfilled in. This has been found in certain places, but they don't go digging that part up yet. Um, so, cause it's just kind of unwieldy in some of the places to try and dig. I mean, it's just sand and, and, and rock. So Sahuri was a, um, Pharaoh who ruled during the fifth dynasty. Yeah. See, that's the later stuff or the, it's the younger stuff, not the older stuff. Um, around 2400 BCE, one document suggests Sahure wasn't a royal lineage, but was said to be the son of Ra, the sun deity, which kind of changes the nature of that. You're not just royal lineage, you're the son of Ra. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> a little um, different there. A little different, yeah. So I wonder why the pyramid is so destroyed. Um, as with other pharaohs, his pyramid stood as a monument to his rule. Um, Borchard left a decent portion of the pyramid unexplored. In 1994, a new excavation began uncovering huge limestone blocks covered with multicolored images. One shows uh, Sahure sailing on a boat with a fleet of boats behind with some bows decorating or decorated with a lion or eagle heads. So now the pyramid's falling. It's been falling apart for thousands of years. So the latest conservation project started in 2019 and the team is working to stabilize the structure. Um, I wonder, there isn't more down here, but, um, the, uh, I wonder what we find, what we will eventually find everything. Okay. Yeah. I was just surprised this was in business insider and not something like fizz.org. Yeah, it might, there might actually be, I mean, some of these links might actually, no, nope, that goes to biz. Oh, no, these are all internal links. Intra oh, there you go. Wurzburg University in Germany. Um, so there, there is probably a research paper. And now a joint Egyptian-German team is working to restore the pyramid as shown, or has shown pairing was correct. That's because they scanned it using modern technology, which I think it's, I think it's awesome. Um, but we'll always find more. Dig a little bit deeper and there's going to be more. So. Or use uh, current technology. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, let's keep going. This next article is uh, going to kind of wound the legal profession, I think. Um, but it's entertaining. This is actually an entertaining article. When you start thinking about all of the warnings that Marowat and the sentient AI have been throwing out for the last two years, AI is full of BS unless it's designed around controlling 
um, or assessing a fixed data set and not being creative, right? Right. It's creative, generative AI is a problem. General generative AI. Yes, it's garbage. It's an exercise in compromise is what, what I said at the last meeting I went to regarding this. Um, because whatever it generates, you have to go, all right, I'm cool with that. But if you give it a data set and you tell it to be creative and it punches out a whole bunch of recipes or generates a whole bunch of new colors that nobody's ever found before. Awesome. You can sit there and go, okay, then I know that it's from my inputs. Um, and you're cool with it. Or you tell it, hey, find all of the uh, interactions between all of these medications, but then you have to verify it anyway, because the wrong you know, permutation from the AI and you end up with a medication that is a false positive or a false negative, and either one is bad. Well, this AI is AI. The question actually is, is AI about to transform the legal profession? Um, well, yes and no. This is a bbc.co.uk article. This is the formal garb for... Yeah, I was wondering if that was the judges. Um, or solicitors. I'm not sure um, exactly which one is... I think everybody wears it, um, depending on the forum. But... Um, so it says, if there is a court case on whether society should embrace artificial intelligence or reject it, it would likely be a hung jury. There's a joke there. Um, here, let me throw this into chat. So if you're hanging out in chat, there you go. Um, so for the legal profession itself, AI represents both, both a threat and an opportunity. It could lead to a savage reduction in jobs for humans. According to a 2021 report from the UK's Law Society, and this uh, study this year from the universities of Pennsylvania, New York, and Princeton estimated that the legal sector has uh, was the industry most likely to be impacted. Hmm. Why do you think that it would be the one most impacted? Because so far, it seems like it's going to be the one that's least impacted. Well, I agree. I don't think. I don't think there's an obvious answer as to why it will be most impacted. Um, I truly don't know. Generative AI can't be creative in law. So why does generative AI supposedly uh, manifest right, so as a threat? So it should be least likely, right? Correct. Yep. And here's why. At the same time, the, the article says, at the same time, AI can play a hugely valuable role in researching and putting cases together. No, no, it cannot. I don't Although, think it can. Again, if it had a fixed um, database, of course, that's a problem, too, because then it might not be updated. Right. And he here's my bigger problem. Well, let's get into it. Well, this actually should be a show all in and of itself. Um, and luckily enough um this being in technology today is one thing but there actually is a show called law nerd um that's supposed to focus on this part of it where it's um talking about law and tech well ai is the culmination of that show basically so here's the deal ai can't be creative in its analysis it has to be precise. It has to be tactical. It has to be concise while still providing copious amounts of information. It can't be fluff. It can't be bullshit. So this says, although there is precedent for things going horribly wrong. Absolutely. New York lawyer, Stephen Schwartz found himself facing his own court hearing this year when he used popular AI system chat GPT to research precedents for a case involving a man suing an airline over personal injury. Remember we said he's going to be in a lawsuit. He's going to be disbarred. We talked about this particular person. Oh yeah. Six of the seven cases he used had been completely made up by the AI. So 
he never looked back at the citations and verified the court record for those citations, which basically meant he threw bullshit at the court and he announced to the world that he didn't do the work without ever saying he didn't do the work. And when he got called to the floor, lo and behold, it turns out that it was all AI. The AI ate my homework and, and then spit out this garbage. So while he may have left uh, many law firms, while that may have left many law firms reluctant to embrace such systems, Ben Algrove, the chief innovation officer at international law firm Baker McKenzie, has a different interpretation. I don't think that it's a technology story. I think it's a lawyer story. You've got to go through the lack of prof <laughs> You've got to get through the lack of professionalism by Mr. Schwartz uh, and the lack of ethics before you get to the fact that the tool was something he shouldn't have been using. Right. But it could have been used. AI can be used. So what I had started using AI for and started doing the fundamental research for probably 15 years ago was using a computer to assess the importance of evidence in a case to calculate the risk slash reward for going to trial. But more powerful AIs and more powerful statistic tool analysis tools came to bear um, like Watson. And so I put that project away. Um, but that is really the only, if you're going to use AI in a creative way, it should be that it can assess a mountain of data and, but you would have to wait all of the evidence and its impact on the case. And that's a perception thing that has a lot of variability between jurors, um, and the actual, um, holistic analysis of that evidence. Like you look at the jurors and you say, Hey, how, how about this evidence? How much did it weigh in on your decision to find them guilty or not guilty? And you'd have to assess them, but we don't do that. We only no, say, we don't even have that data to input. Right. Again, another reason why I was in the fundamental research side of things, but you can't sit in a courtroom and take pictures of evidence and then question the jury. Um, you, you have to be on the outside and you don't never get the full array of, uh, evidence because a lot of it is shared between attorneys, but then they say they strike this, they strike that they decide that they're not going to use this or that or whatever. Um, but the jury only sees a small snippet of the total evidence that may lay sway in the case. So. This person, um, Ben Algrove, the chief innovation officer, basically says that they shouldn't have been using it. Well, they did, though, and many may be still using it, but now they're vetting those uh, cited cases. Baker McKenzie has been tracking developments of in, a, uh, in AI since 2017 has set up a team of lawyers, data scientists and data engineers to test the new systems that are coming out. And this is why I had um, spoke to you briefly. Mr. Algrove thinks that the vast majority of AI usage in his firm will come from using new AI powered versions of existing legal software providers like Lexus, Lexus Nexus and Microsoft's 365 solution for legal. Uh, what? So I haven't even found that. I don't know what the, the latter is. Lexus Texas is for legal research. Right. Um, and so where's West in this? Is Westlaw not doing anything? Apparently they're going to be subsumed by Microsoft. Well, I mean, they're, they're just as well known as Lexus Nexus. So yeah, I'm surprised that they're not mentioned in this. Maybe they are later on, but. So LexisNexis launched an AI, its AI platform back in May, which can answer legal questions, generate documents and summarize legal issues. Here's my problem. Answering legal questions. The AI shouldn't be answering legal questions. Um, generating documents and summarizing legal issues. Sure. 
but the attorney or a subordinate is going a paralegal is going to have to sit there and assess all of it. And now you're billing for the AI to run uh, generation analysis is, uh, you know, what's the legality well, and of that? I keep coming back to, doesn't the person have to redo the, all the information in order to verify it, which then means what's the point? Yep. Yep. Plus in a, in a law firm, if you get all of that data thrown at somebody and it turns out to be a waste of time, you're billing a customer for analyze, reanalyzing what a computer may have overwhelmed and uh, um, a, typically a paralegal does a lot of the grunt work. And then the attorney goes, yeah, okay, that's good. You know, or they get pointed in another direction to find additional context. Well, don't you see there being some backlash among clients when the bills start coming out related to AI? Hey, nobody complains until they don't win the case. In, in the they may AI. complain if they're a small business and they're like, why am I paying X amount of dollars for a computer, which I could use myself? The AI aspect of it may never even come to bear, right? They may never say, hey, we use an AI to summarize cases. So we already use LexisNexis and Microsoft, and they will increasingly get capabilities uh, driven by generative AI. And we will buy those things if they make sense and are at the right price. So basically they're saying that they're going to just keep on using AI. Even in the face of uh, <laughs> legal cases you know, <laughs> thrown under the bus of generative AI, such crucial testing is crucially explained to validate performance because all of the systems will uh, all make errors. Yes, but there's a difference between a document that's full of crap and a, a bad legal researcher, <laughs> a bad legal researcher. You can sit there and go, Hey, that's a bad legal researcher. But a, a law firm using an AI is there is a ton of garbage and then you have to do the legal research again. So where is the benefit? Um, I, think I don't it's, see it. Yeah, I don't either. Unless they have a, again, a very specific database. It's constantly updated. And then they're willing to put in. I mean, my point is, is the data that's in there good to right. begin with? Because that's been a lot of the problem with AI products to date. Yeah. So I see LexisNexis being able to use AI to um, make more symbolic links between cases so that when somebody pulls that record, they can go, okay, this is how it's connected and everything is flagged. You know, uh, um, uh, what is it called? Westlaw does the, the like shepherdizing. Um, so I think that's the only thing really the the little flags are going to be the warning signs that whatever research is being punched out by LexisNexis is going to be garbage. Um, because people rely on LexisNexis now, the core of it shouldn't change. It's just that people are going to have to filter our, through a little bit of fluff and, and look for those red flags and stay away from even the yellow ones. So um, it'll, it, this will be interesting to see what the legal profession does. Um, but just generative, creative garbage, no more. It has to be inside that walled garden of the legal research uh, providers like LexisNexis and Westlaw. And apparently now Microsoft. <laughs> and what's this other one, Clio or something like that? Have you heard of that? I don't know. I don't know what that is. Yeah, there's another thing. Um, anyway, I'll take a look at it later. Um, to make sure information is accurate, Robin AI has a team of human lawyers working alongside the AI. Alex Monaco is an employment lawyer who runs both his own uh, solicitor practice and a tech firm called Grapple. Grapple was um, developed to provide members of the public with what Mr. Monaco calls an ontology of employment law and offers advice on a range of workplace issues from bullying and harassment to redundancy. 
It can generate legal matters and provide summaries of cases. Again, if it reaches into creative anything, it's all bullshit. So this article is actually quite interesting, um, but long. Um, so we're going to have to go on to the next article and uh, we'll come back to this because this will be an ongoing concern. Guarantee it. So the next article is over in Prime Glass, British Museum to digitize collection as over 2 million objects are found to be undocumented. How many of these were the things that were stolen? Yeah, really, that would be interesting to know. I'm not sure. Um, It says George Osborne, the chairman of the trustees, says the thefts began over two decades ago. Pretty amazing. So, and here's the problem. This is, uh, okay, as one million objects, two million objects. What the heck? The article shifted. That's interesting. Um, so the article changed the title to over uh, collection as one million objects are found to be undocumented. So the thefts of 2000 gems at the British Museum began 20 to 25 years ago, according to George Osborne, the chairman of the trustees. The shocking news was revealed yesterday to the House of Commons Culture, Media and Sport Committee. Wow, that's weird. Um, following the theft, it has now been determined that the museum has 2,400,000 uncatalogued or partially catalogued objects that need to be properly documented. It was the failure to have the recorded, to, I, it's a weird, this seems like it's AI generated, uh, to have recording the gems, which made it possible for an insider to gradually steal them from the storeroom without being detected for decades. Cataloging will take an estimated five years and cost $10 million. Osborne, a former chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, said that the government has not been approached for financial help. No details on how this work will be funded were given. So, yeah. Uh, the thing about this is, I okay, so stuff got stolen. But this stuff would have been, by the time you catalog, assess... And, and determine the importance of these items. A hundred generations could have come and gone. It's 2.4 million objects. There's only so many people, so much bandwidth. So why, why was it like this? We have modern technology. They chose to only rely on the stuff that they deemed important when there could be some detail in one of these other items that changes the perception of culture and society and in humanity in general, you know, what if there's something in there, but somebody decided that it wasn't going to be important. Mark Jones, the new interim museum director also gave evidence to the commons committee. He said that the 2000 uncatalogued, it says 2000 now uncatalogued objects stolen. So 2000 were stolen. Um, Oh, okay really known only to one person and that person decided to take advantage of that so so that's a problem too right you have to have redundancy correct yeah more than one point of failure you remember we talked about this actually this person well that's why i asked how many were stolen because um i recognized this with the british museum that it was connected that's actually why it was submitted yeah Although a museum is not naming the museum is not naming the individual. It's they've been identified uh, by the media as Peter Higgs, a curator for 30 years and recently acting keeper of the Greece and Rome department. Higgs was dismissed in July and has been interviewed by the police, but has not been arrested or charged. His son maintains his father's innocence. So until otherwise, I would say that he could be the scapegoat for a much greater scheme absolutely we don't know no so it's i i I guess i should have just ignored that name and and said no not until they're actually formally um charged but i guess 
its standard information now. So Osborne was scathing in his criticism of the museum's handling by Fisher and Williams of the initial theft allegations. He told the Commons Committee in 2021, the museum received an email from a reputable antiquarian dealer who said that things are being stolen. They are for sale and I think I've bought them. And who, by the way, identified an individual who believed was responsible. Osborne is disturbed that the museum failed to make proper use of this information. Quote, that, to my mind, is a big question for the museum, which the independent review needs to properly address. The review established by the trustees is expected to report in December. Well, and of course, one problem with reporting it to the museum is it's quite possible that it was intercepted by the person, whomever <laughs> it is, conducting yeah. the theft. Yeah. Delay, delay, delay. And even a delay can sit there and change the, the tone of any investigation. People's memories become fuzzy. Although the historical record probably has recordings all over the place of that person walking into a pawn shop or whatever on X day, whatever it might be. All right, let's keep going. Come on. I do it too fast. It resets. So the next article is over in the mobile channel. Um, dun, dun, dun. There we go. Uh, thousands of IT contractors in U S sent millions to fund North Korea missile program. According to the FBI, thousands of information technology workers working remotely for the U S um, have for years sent millions of dollars to North Korea under the radar to fund its weapons program. According to uh, federal prosecutors, the way that this is written, um, thousands of IT contractors in U S sent millions to fund North Korea missile program. Sounds like North Korea is sending millions to U S contractors. Right. It's, it's very confusing <laughs> in terms of the wording. Yeah. Um, the justice department in a statement on Wednesday said authorities see 17 website domains used by North Korean IT workers in a scheme to defraud the U S and foreign businesses, evade sanctions and fund the country's ballistic missile program. This comes on top of $1.5 million in revenue. The workers collected from their victims that was apprehended in January. Do you remember hearing about that? No, I don't remember seeing anything about this before. Hmm. Olafimian Ocean is the author. Biden, by the way, is talking right now. Um, has been for 30 minutes, but anyway, um, thousands of information workers, uh, working remotely for the U S company for U S companies have for years sent millions of dollars to North Korea. According to the FBI, there really isn't much more to this article other than to say that, um, until you get to the very bottom where it says the news comes as United Nation experts signaled earlier this year, North Korean based working hackers stole record breaking virtual assets in 2022 that were estimated to be worth between 630 million and more than $1 billion. Is that related to the FTX implosion? I'm not sure what it all is. Um, we'd have to take a look. I'm really curious because it just says assets, virtual assets, which probably is crypto because that's uh, whenever there is something that is an a, a virtual asset, it's crypto. And when it's crypto, it's always big, big, big numbers because it's all built on the speculation of those values, not the actual translated costs. Not everybody gets a, the ability to sell their cryptocurrency at 60,000 us dollars per Bitcoin. So, um, let's keep going. Uh, the next article is over in the constructagon category. Um, fictive it's a channel constructagon focuses on 3d printing. Fictive expands 3D printing service with 14 new materials for advanced engineering. San Francisco based <laughs> San Francisco based manufacturing bureau Fictive 
has announced uh, significant updates to its 3D printing service. In doing so, Fictive aims to better serve the needs of its industrial customers engaged in demanding additive manufacturing programs. So 3D printing. Um, subtractive manufacturing is things like CNC and lathe work and stuff like that. So Fictive's recent addition contains 14 new materials tailored for advanced engineering applications. So high temperature options and um, a bunch of others. Uh, Ultim 9085. Um, that, I think is Ultim is a plastic. Is that consumer grade or? Um, I'm sorry? Is that consumer grade or is that something larger scale? Yeah, it's industrial and, and like it says here, biocompatible. Um, ABS M30i alongside with the the introduction of a range of optical SOMOS materials. These cater to automotive, industrial, consumer products, and medical applications, including functional assemblies, jigs, features, and mass production. Ultim, I think, is a plastic, if I remember right. Um, there were... Now I'm confused, because um, I've heard of Ultim, but um, I, I don't really remember what it is. But um, a lot of it, oh, it, Ultim 1010 exhibits high heat and chemical resistance. And um, I think it's, yeah, it's a thermoplastic known for strength, heat resistance, and chemical durability. So, but Ultim is expensive. So, um, supposed to be really amazing stuff, but still, it's a thermoplastic. So TPU 88A is a flexible rubber-like material ideal for crafting elastomeric parts, footwear components, and impact-resistant items. Um, like I can print stuff with TPU um, with a 3D printer, and it can be like a ball, a stress ball, and it'll bounce back. You know, you squeeze it, and it'll bounce back. Oh, it's back. like flubber. <laughs> yeah, actually, TPU probably, yeah, is um, pretty much... I don't know if I think Flubber ended up being sentient or something like that, right? I don't remember. I don't remember the details of it. <laughs> um, and but they talk about all of the various um, materials that Fictive is going to have. But there you go. Some of this stuff requires um, it being uh, printed in a rarefied atmosphere. I'll put it to you that way. Either colder or hotter in a vacuum. Um, or near vacuum. And so the printers actually have to change to facilitate the printing uh, requirements. Some of the stuff that I've printed, for instance, had to be uh, inside uh, a heated chamber, but not like wildly heated, um, but enough so that it uh, would actually bond layer after layer. So let's go on to the next. There's a bunch of stuff that we can talk about. The next one's going to make everybody hungry. This one's in Gnometown Daily. Crumble is testing Hot Pockets style savory hand pies. I'm already in the car leaving Gnometown. <laughs> um, but how do you know if they're actually making these it yet? It <laughs> does not matter. I will be there in line waiting. If it's anything close to their cookies, I'm going to be all over these like chocolate chips in a crumble cookie. <laughs> so the six flavor options include shepherd's pie win barbecue Mac. I don't know about that one. Um, pizza probably I'm all over that one. Ham and cheesy potato. Um, depending on who you are, get rid of the ham, um, bacon and egg, which again, depending on who you are, get rid of the bacon and chicken pot pie. All of these speak to me in in almost angelic voices, <laughs> um, but or uh, like mermaids. I'm being beckoned to the oh, like the siren. Yes, the sirens call of the crumble savory hand pie. The article's actually over at Newsweek.com. Suzanne Blake is the author. Um, I didn't throw this into the chat, but there you go, folks. Um, so it's an Suzanne interesting branch out because it doesn't have anything to do with cookies, right? Like they only make sweet items right now, cookies and I think ice cream. Um, so it's an interesting 
Do they make Changes. ice cream? Really? Hmm. Yeah, they do. Interesting. I didn't know that they made ice cream. I've only sat there and looked at the menu like somebody blew a dog whistle. Huh? Which one should I pick? Which one should I pick? And the mystery cookie is... So Crumble, the beloved cookie chain with more than 900 locations nationwide, is testing out something unexpected. Savory hand pies. You know, the smells from savory hand pies is going to poison pill the cookie side. So it had better be on two different rooms. Right. The new snacks, which resemble traditional empanadas, went live in one location in Utah. I got to go. <clears throat> You're already driving to Utah. I'm off to Utah. And customers already have a lot to say about them. The various turnovers stuffed with fillings like uh, pizza toppings and mac and cheese are currently available in the flagship store in Provo, Utah. Um, $4.99 a four pack is $15. So everybody go for the four pack. That's the one that makes sense. But it, I guess it depends, you know, if if it's at the same scale as these, you know what I'm saying? Like a regular cookie is this big, a crumble cookie is this sure. big and that thick. So if a regular shepherd's pie is this big, then a shepherd's pie from crumble had better be like this big and that thick um, for $4.49. But are there any pictures of it? No, no pictures. There's no pictures of these. I can't believe they don't have any pictures. Yeah, they got the crumble cookies, but they don't have the crumble savory pies. I am disappointed. But that's okay, folks. Um, I'm sure that we'll have them. I'm probably going to do end up doing a follow-up of this because... I thought you were going to drive to Provo, Utah. I might. Let's keep going. The next article is over in the Mobile Channel. Tech breathes new life into endangered Native American languages. Hmm, where have you heard about using technology to save lost or l languages that are uh, going to be extinct? Hmm. Well, here I, in hometown. I, I believe that there was a person with the last name what? First name starts with an M. Say it with me. Mayor? Mayor Watt. Mayor Watt. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. This is probably along with the ability to do deep fakes, essentially, our, uh, you know, artificial intelligence can break out the phonemes of various, uh, not just Native American languages, but languages around the world that are slowly dying off because people are uh converging into dominant languages basically to survive these other smaller subset dialects and whatnot could actually be saved in perpetuity forever um this is I, really amazing this is a good use of technology to me yeah like right now i have i have a recording um and I would probably say I'm the only one on the planet that has a recording of someone. And I could take that recording, break it up into its phonemes and have that voice say whatever I want right now. Um, that is, and it was recorded and now it will last forever as long as no one deletes it. Right why have we allowed languages to slowly die off with the population that no longer uh you know practices it and shares it with enough regularity that the youth of today don't want to learn a a, a language another language in mass right not with enough replacement value for for every person that uh, ages out that dies you have to have one person and then some that's why the nuclear family is 2.5 because you have to have replacement value on top of the replacement value a little bit of juice because of accidents taking out somebody else so you can't have half a person so you end up with three you round up although anyway 
Um, linguistic experts are turning to cutting edge technologies to revitalize threatened Native American languages and rejuvenate generations of indigenous tradition through new approaches such as children's books and smartphone apps. So I love the idea of recapturing Native American languages. Um, don't let modernity wipe out the historical record of yeah, proud uh, it's native american but aboriginal original peoples all they spoke languages that we need to keep it so that we have a historical record the context of humanity throughout time um so the article is actually over at fizz.org and nicholas i think is is that their actual last name revise i i feel like that's like a I feel like that's an organization or right. something. So that's okay. We'll go on. Um, in one such endeavor, three Native American women rack their brains as they gather around a computer trying to remember and record dozens of Apache language words related to everyday activities such as cooking and eating. They are creating an online English Apache dictionary, just one of several projects working to preserve endangered indigenous languages in the United States. Uh, the women are working with rapid word collection uh, software which uses an algorithm to search Apache text and audio databases for so-called forgotten words. The words are then defined, translated into English, and the pronunciation recorded so the dictionary's users will know how to say them properly. This is brilliant. It's basically, um, what's the, the language app that was looking for somebody to train the owl? Duolingo. Duolingo. Yeah. So it's like the Duolingo for uh, Apache. So this is awesome. Um, so teacher uh, Jocelyn Johnson and two of her colleagues validate the definition of the word Apache. Uh, sorry, the it says of the word Apache word kapas, which means potato in English. So they kind of flubbed that um, sentence right there. Anyway, um, the application is written uh, in the written language are good for a non-speaker at least they'll have a museum of where it can go in go to for a reference said johnson a 68 year old who teaches apache vocabulary and grammar this is just brilliant i love this i love the idea of this because if i am curious about something i would be able to even online access this record um and and that knowledge would be shared and i'd be able to tell other people about it go ahead Absolutely. Well, I thought there was an interesting statistic. Hmm. So this person teaches um, this language and out of a thousand students, only one is actually fluent in it. And oh, so wow. that just shows you why these languages are dying out among younger generations. Yeah. One Maybe they're grader. focused only on English, for instance. True. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Uh, Johnson spoke as just one of several workshops in the International Conference on, Indi on Indigenous Language Documentation, Education, and Revitalization uh, last week at the University of Indiana. University of Indiana has so much information that it processes. Right. I would love to have gone there, but I didn't. I might have been able to find my calling earlier. 4,500 languages at risk. See, this is the problem. And and then a little bit further down, they say one of more than 6,000 indigenous languages recognized globally. So 6,000 indigenous languages recognized, 4,500 at risk. It's amazing. But then they say nearly half of them at risk. With about 1,500 facing immediate extinction, according to a 2021 study from UNESCO. So sad. And there's no reason to. You can send somebody out and, and have them just mine it. So there was a movie, and I can't remember what it was, but um, it's this dystopian future movie um, where people were trying to hunt down this person who's um, traveling the wasteland, um, trying to get to um, like a safe zone. And people are chasing them down, trying to get um, a book that he has and everybody it, it alludes to being a religious book um, and by the time he makes it to the other side I don't know if I'm ruining this 
He didn't say the name of it, so I don't I, think so. I know. Well, uh, so eventually, on the other side of this, you find out that he's blind and that the book that somebody actually got a hold of is in Braille. Oh. And so um, the person at the gate asks him, what do you have that we should allow you in to our sanctuary? And he says, I've got um, a book. And they're, they're like, you don't have a book. And he goes, it's in here. And so he had memorized this book because he had been reading it constantly. Um, and so that's kind of what this is. We have the potential to record it for posterity forever. You know, we are going to continually forget our lessons and take away the worst lessons. Um, so anyway, it says it allows us to serve languages quickly and build the infrastructure that we need to be able to survive moving forward. The 51 year old Austrian American anthropologist explained. Let's see, anthropology folks. Yeah. Okay. Let's just keep going. 23 and me. What are you doing? Hometown daily is where the start of our week. Tell me about it. They're spraying their DNA all over the place. 23 and me says it's looking into another possible data leak. They're investigating reports of a new data leak involving millions of user records. On Wednesday, TechCrunch reported that a hacker claims to have leaked 4 million genetic profiles belonging to people in Great Britain, along with the wealthiest people living in the United States and Western Europe. The hacker who goes by Gollum, which is different than the other one, because the oh, other okay. one I can remember was the hacker name. talking about Ashkenazi uh, profiles. So it might be the same one, but they are. this is something different as well. Um, so uh, what is it? Three now, maybe. So the hacker took credit for the last 23 me breach says, uh, they've obtained another trove of genetic information. So they're still in there. Maybe Emma Roth over at the verge, put the article together. The hacker, the hacker goes by Gollum. Katie Watson, the vice president of communications for 23 and me tells the verge, the company was made aware <laughs> that the same hacker claims to have hacked another trove of what they claim is uh, customer information in a blog published uh, blog post published on October 6th, 23 and me confirmed that the DNA data are data profiles and whatnot um, in the previous and affected the platform's DNA relatives feature, which lets users match with potential genetic relatives on 23 and me. So even if they didn't want if somebody didn't want to be told that they were a genetic relative, like, you know, if I am the father and I don't want to meet now, somebody can get this data and connect the two. How well, about absolutely. That? I mean, DNA data is probably the worst thing to leak. Yep. So at the time, 23andMe said it found no sign of a security incident within its systems, adding that the hacker was able to access users' accounts using recycled login credentials that were exposed in other hacks. So I hate to break it to you, but no sign of a security incident means that you're just ignorant of the fact that recycled credentials are still live alive in your system. The moment you were told that there were recycled credentials, you should have forced a uh, a mass change in your um, password system and required two-factor authentication. Um, th this is this is the bad bat equivalent of security management. This is so stupid. This most recent leak involves the DNA relatives feature as well, potentially enabling the hacker to scrape the information belonging to the relatives uh, that an account has matched to. So. This is just a hot mess. Um, and I, I was considering sending, um, um, what, do you, I, what do you call it? A sample to 23andMe. Uh, Cause I'm really curious about the full genomic breakdown. I want to, I want the whole data set um, to, to you know, ruminate on. So anyway, let's keep going. There's not much more to that article. The next article is over in technology today. Uh, let me do something real quick. 
Let me grab that and throw it into chat so that it's in the VOD in the right order. There you go. So the next article is in technology today. FCC moves forward with its plan to restore net neutrality protections. The funny thing about this is that uh, earlier this week, I was actually telling people uh, we don't really need to talk about net neutrality other than it, historically it did this. But because we have kind of wing nutty dissenters that are in control, um, it was wiped out. And that's why you may get um, poorer service if you're sitting on a competitor's platform um, because they're manipulating the data stream. So, Could you give a brief explanation of what net neutrality is for those listeners that aren't familiar with it? Sure. So net neutrality implies that data can traverse the internet without any adulterations, no manipulations, no slowdowns, no tweaking, but with the removal of net neutrality, deep packet inspection and uh, traffic shaping was made possible. So as was reported over the course of several years, if you were on Comcast, let's say, and I'm just using these as an example, um, because there are reports about it, but I'd have to go and look at the actual specific cases. But the reports were something similar to you were on Comcast watching Netflix, but your Netflix video wasn't at the high quality that you're paying for. And it just so happens that Comcast has a competing streaming service. And so I can tell you from experience that I lived through something similar to that, but with high speed internet in that a service that I had spun up, um, and had gone nationwide, um, was hobbled because what I was doing was providing free access, but I needed to go from dial up to uh, DSL or high speed internet. But my competition were the actual ISPs that would be getting paid um, by the customers. So the, it, it turned into eight weeks, nine weeks before installation of the service. So essentially as time went on, it died. So <clears throat> the, the problem here is that without net neutrality, competitors can impact my customer's relationship with my service. Meanwhile, they can sit there and punch an ad in to their face and say, Hey, you know how Netflix is really slow? Well, if you watch this movie, the same movie you're watching now over on Comcast, you're good to go. It'll be it in near four. Great for the large businesses. Right. Yep. Not necessarily the consumer. Now, and again, it's just an example, but instead of sitting there saying Joe blows bait and tackle internet streaming service, it's I'm making it a little more, uh, you know, approachable, understandable, uh, by using these two companies, but that's what net neutrality is. It's the unadulterated access to traffic on the internet, um, which is not what you have now. They shape the FCC has, and I think it's already gone to the Supreme Court, basically saying that ISPs have the ability to shape traffic on their network. So somebody could be a bottleneck, but that's not what the Internet was supposed to be. The Internet was supposed to be unfettered data traversing the network and only in the event of a nuclear bomb detonation would traffic be reshaped. That was the purpose of the robust Internet. So. FCC Chairwoman uh, Jessica Rosenworcel 
who has long supported net neutrality rules, last month announced a proposal to reclassify fixed broadband as an essential communication under the Title II of the Communications Act of 1934, which is the first step to making it so that net neutrality returns. Chris Holt is a contributing reporter for Engadget. The commissioners advanced a proposal to reclassify broadband as an essential communication service, which it wholly is. By the way, in the future, y'all don't ever use. Oh, these aren't actually punch downs. These are telecom jacks. Never mind. Um, so one of the three agencies, uh, Democratic commissioners voted in favor of the notice of proposed rulemaking with the two Republican uh, commissioners dissenting. There was another uh, Republican chairperson who all was known for having a big cup, a, a big coffee mug. The guy was uh, to me a tool, but anyway, um, this person supports net neutrality. Why? Because it benefits the consumer. It benefits the general citizenry. Um, so if broadband is reclassified in this way, the FCC would have greater scope to regulate in a similar way to how water power and phone services are overseen. As such, it would have more leeway to reestablish net neutrality rules. I think that's what should be happening. Um, the proposed net neutrality rules will ensure that all viewpoints, including those which I disagree with, uh, are heard. Commissioner Anna Gomez, who was sworn in the panel's third Democratic member um, in September, said ahead of the vote. Um, but I think that this is a misperception, honestly. N net neutrality doesn't have anything over the, the ethical or moral data um, that is in a packet. It's supposed to be focused on the transmission of data across the lines. So unless there's something in the net neutrality rules that starts speaking to the actual quote unquote freedom of speech, freedom of speech doesn't even apply. So I'm not quite sure what this person is really saying. Um, net neutrality rules will ensure that all data gets to its destination unfettered unadulterated unmanipulated um so this this commissioner gomez doesn't really this one statement kind of diminished my impression of them um so they end up talking about this further and further um down the line but really what you should be doing is if you want to make sure that your data is traversing the network without somebody manipulating it then go over to the electronic frontier foundation look up net neutrality um i i don't have um quick links to actually go to it um more focused than that but i can definitely support you looking up net neutrality and we can talk about it um, if anybody emails me or I start getting messages over on uh, YouTube or here on Twitch, um, I'm sure that I can um, you know, spin up a special session and we can talk about that. Much like intellectual property or um, various other matters, uh, artificial intelligence, technology, business. Um, all of your channels. Yeah, all of my channels. There's 50 channels. So... Our last article is basically uh, one where <laughs> Eddie Bauer says, you don't understand pretty squiggles. So let's go. So uh, in one of the very few um, highlights from semiotic ontology, because it's a very, it's rarefied air here. Um, it's a group dedicated to semiotic ontology, which is how, things acquire meaning, um, typically symbols. Um, so the, the most well-known semiotic ontology example is a stop sign. Why is it in that shape? Why is it red? Why is it called stop? Even without the word stop, you know that that sign means stop. It has acquired meaning that goes beyond the direct definition of it. It's almost meme-like in structure, what semiotic ontology is, except that you can enumerate what all of the values are. Um, it's quite a fascinating discipline. Well, Eddie Bauer changed his logo because Gen Z doesn't read cursive. 
That's interesting. I think that's the first instance I've heard of that. But aren't there more to follow? I mean, thinking yes. of future generations. Yeah, I mean, people are forgetting how to uh, write. Um, we still know how to sign because, like, write a signature in cursive, but it's usually chicken scratch, like, barely a thing. Um, but pe most people don't contest it because it, it's actually the authorization. Um, but here, here's the thing. They changed their logo <laughs> from the cursive and they added, um, they embraced the symbology of this. So after 59 years, outdoor outfitter, Eddie Bauer is trading its cursive logo for something a bit more tangible, a goose, but not just a, a goose. It's block lettering Eddie Bauer and a goose. So let's go take a look at it. <laughs> Analyzingtrends.com. Eddie Bauer changed its logo because Gen Z doesn't read cursive. Um, I don't see, I guess the byline could be Tim Stock and Marie Lena Tupot, um, but it doesn't have it down here. So I'm kind of, oh my God. This is the first time that I have actually seen semiotics used. Anywhere. Anywhere in the two years that we've been doing this, it's well, year and 10 months. So after 59 years after our Eddie uh, outfitter, Eddie Bauer is trading its cursive logo for something a bit more tangible, a goose, but not just a goose. The bird is accompanied by simplified version of the brand name. Hey, I hadn't read any of this. Um, on the full stack logo, additional details include the company's date of establishment, 1920, and the phrase outdoor outfitters. It's a major rebrand of the brand uh, that launches on Eddie Bauer's digital platforms today and will start to appear in international brick and mortars on a rolling basis. And by fall 2024, all Eddie Bauer products will begin to feature the updated logo. So everything Eddie Bauer is now a collector's item, folks. Because unless something dramatically changes, like we go back to the 18th, 19th and 20th century, we're going to stay with this block lettering and a logo. In fact, I think that we're trending more towards that symbolic representation of data um, because things like, oh, never mind, it's no longer Twitter, huh? Well, anyway, um, we used to embrace the Twitter logo as a tweet and as the company representation, right? Twitter, it was the brand logo and you had brand awareness. Now you got this stupid X, but um, a lot of companies, either their word mark is their logo, uh, but it isn't a logo. A word mark is a word mark. A logo is that. So, this is going to be, this is supposed to become synonymous with Eddie Bauer. Who thinks Eddie Bauer is a goose? Well, <laughs> I was actually looking up another article that got into a little bit of the history. Um, apparently that is a connection to the, con to the company, but not necessarily anybody knows that in modern times because Eddie Bauer was the first to patent a, um, a oh, goose, goose down call. jacket. Oh, really? A goose down jacket? <laughs> I was thinking a goose collar or something like that. You know, that thing, that's the that person, weird... not the company, but um, maybe it was assigned to the company. I don't know. Interesting. So they made a goose down pillow. Goose down jacket. Oh, jacket. Sorry, jacket. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what Eddie Bauer is really known for. So yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't listening that all that well, I guess, talking over you. Um, by fall 2024, all of the products are going to have this new block lettering because y'all can't read this. I'm pretty sure that everybody was looking at it going Betty Baver. Doesn't that look like a backwards Betty Baver? That little, that looks like a, a wonky bee. <laughs> yeah, it does. Or a QE. It's Quetty Baver. There you go. 
Anyway, now you make no mistake, it's Eddie Bauer and the Goose logo or is going to be falling short after that. So there you go, folks. Um, Eddie Bauer changing its name. Everything is going to have the that has the original logo is going to be much more expensive. So the little snippet um, from analyzingtrends.com actually has a big old ugly link in it that sends you over to Fast Company. I don't normally do that daisy chain kind of a thing, um, but I think it's important to actually um, link you to that actual source, which is Fast Company. Since then, the goose has popped back up in Eddie Bauer's branding materials from t-shirts to print ads, but beyond its sentimental value, the bird also serves as a psychological function. Part of what I realized is that we were trying to take this word, Eddie Bauer, and make it an icon, which is really hard for people versus having an icon itself. Exactly. It's a symbolic link to the meaning of what Eddie Bauer is, and Eddie Bauer stands for Urban Outfitter, basically. Not Urban Outfitter, but like uh, just nature um, outfitting for, uh, weather and, uh, going out and rock climbing and, uh, essentially urban right, outfitting. being outdoors. Yeah. So it's, um, it's pretty neat. Uh, they talk about it becoming a, an issue of legibility. So Bantel and his team initially toyed with the idea of keeping the script font. The uh, general reaction they received was that it looked dated and to some confusing a big part of what I'm need to do going to need to do here is reintroduce this great heritage brand to the next generation and kids don't learn to read cursive in school anymore that's right so there you go folks eddie bauer as a cursive logo is gone probably forever i don't i really doubt it'll ever return um this this can be read for miles. Look at this. You can read Eddie I Bauer for miles. I actually prefer the new one as much yeah. as I think it's a shame that it has to be changed because of the reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's much more legible. Yeah. This was one of the things that I said um, fairly recently. I, I told somebody that the design needs to be uh, so simple that it can be seen for miles. Um, that way there's, there's no, like, what does that say? And then they're lost because they're driving by or whatever. Um, if it's going to be on a shirt, it needs to be big, bold, beautiful, right out there. Nobody wondering what the hell it says, not a spelling bee, not an artistic expression as the main method to get the message out. You can have something a little more artistic somewhere else, but if you want somebody to pay attention to you, it has to be something like this, or you have to educate and that takes time and money. So not everybody has a lot of time and money left. So that's it folks. We are done for today. All 10 not set up and knocked down. Dun, dun, dun. We drag you all the way back to main street and we hit that welcome sign. It's a big, uh, goldenrod color today but shortly it'll change to a blue um let's see anything interesting well there's a lot about the middle east um yeah. warheimer 40,000 uh rogue trader has an alignment system sort of yeah uh, this is still somewhat popular um, Rotten Tomatoes articles, TechCrunch articles. Um, I <laughs> the aggregator grabs things like Snopes. What is going on? Um, Harry Potter remake must repeat the movie's best casting decision. So uh, there's something coming what out that is. <laughs> for Harry Potter that's going to be on HBO. It says remake, but I don't know if that's there's something coming. But there's been a kerfuffle uh, because of uh, other issues. And then that wand issue the other day that we talked about. Oh, that's right. And she always does. Like somebody will say something and she'll throw out a, uh, some comment 
and it all starts over again rowling um i mean it's too bad because it's such a a massive enterprise and so many fans so much world building to be have the water drain from it simply because but it i mean rowling it's having a row is in her name for crying out loud (laughs) apple podcast integration with amazon alexa now available in uh, more countries there's something else happening with podcasts um from apple but i'm not yeah i forgot what it was yeah we'll have to uh, i'm sure more information because it was uh, as far as i recall it's being talked about but not deployed so we'll see we'll probably end up talking about it tomorrow um well anyway all kinds of news folks go over to hometown.com um you don't have to spend all forever there but if you sign in or sign up then you get additional functionality um like sorting the material into little save lists and if you also click on a link and you're logged in you can actually tag it so that it becomes like a favorite of yours and you can send that favorite list to people um and uh, there's other things once you sign in or and become a citizen of hometown you'll be authorized to send in links and other content that we will assess and integrate into um hometown's data stream so stick around folks things are still happening hometown is kind of like a construct uh, always under construction but without the potholes and poor roads you can fly freely all throughout hometown and nothing's going to get in your way no potholes no drainage issues um no sirens you know nothing to really upset the turnip truck but look at that six main categories 50 channels all in niche topics um if you're a writer you want to go into breaking prose if you do world building you want to do it in Aerith. if you are into uh, virtual reality augmented reality or mixed reality or doing something in a computer where you are hacking reality then you're going to be in reality hacker it's pretty obvious stuff there right gets a little bit more abstract but the tech side is really heavy-handed a bunch of different categories entertainment is mostly drinking various things of the bean is coffee of the brew is beer of the grape is wine of the leaf is tea of the still is adult spirits um mix war is the entertainment show where i want people to um mix music and and battle for first place and distillerist is a show that i want to put together that involves talking about the people and culture and and uh, drinking of distilled spirits just like you know kind of like of the still but that one's more news related anyway that's it folks thanks for coming i am Merwat. that is hometown.com and up there is the ai that's gonna say Bye-bye. Good night, hometown citizens. We will see you tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern. Bye-bye. Hey, you did it. You didn't really do a deep voice. Bye-bye, but okay. See you, everybody. Oh, don't forget to download the podcast. It's it's all up to date. Go and check it out and, and leave a five-star review and, and a comment, and I'll say it on the air. <laughs>